I think about that, Dino. <laughs> you're, good, you're good. Hey, everybody. Welcome to SVT time. We're live again. It's Thursday. It's SVT time. It's me, Dino, Dom, my beautiful co-host, co-host, sorry. <laughs> and today we have Mike Inez, the awesome Mike inez with us. Mike, thanks so much for doing this, brother. Thank you for having me, Dino, my base brother. It's, it's like it's been a hundred years since the last time we hung out. You know, it feels it. I think I, I feel like a hundred years old right about now. <laughs> yeah. Man, how you guys doing, Dom? How you doing? Everybody healthy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mike, everybody healthy on your end? You guys all good? Fantastic. Yeah, can't wait to the, for the world to get back to normal. You know, so we can start making some racket again. Yeah. You know, I know it. I know we're almost there. That's the thing. It's like I'm starting to, you know, I'm starting to get calls for gear and this and that. And, you know, like just, just I think people are doing the groundwork so that when this thing does open up, it everybody's kind of ready to go. You know, yeah. I, I had I I had a uh, I had my rig set up in my garage. Yes. And my wife comes home from work. She goes, what are you doing? I had all my stuff set up. I was like, well, you never know when I'm going to get a call. For a gig <laughs> Summer. So right. I just got everything's up and running. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I'm seeing more and more tour announcements every day, and it's feeling good. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just don't want it, everybody to get sick. It's, it's so weird. It's like uh, uncharted territory, the wild west for everybody. I mean, down to the caterers and the truck drivers and the, oh. the support staff at the venues and uh, record company. It's just man, it's across the board. I've never seen anything like this in the yeah. thirty yeah. years I've been doing this. Thirty-one years, you know. God. Yeah. 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 Speak, speaking of that, Mike, so if you don't mind, can we talk about your beginnings and, and how you got started? In, in uh, Did you start as a bass player originally or did you come up through a school band or what was your process? Yeah, all of that. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, uh, like I come from a, a long line of musicians, actually, you know, like a, a Filipino church musicians, you know, from, and uh, I was the second generation my mom oh no my my mom was born in manila so i'm the first generation that was born here in the valley in san fernando valley and uh my uncle matt uh my mom's younger brother was in a band uh and they rehearsed at my grandmother's house okay so when they, they always tell this story like when when they had me at the hospital i just came out of my mother that night they came home and they had me the new baby they walked into the house and uh, they had to go yell at my uncle's band to shut the fuck up, right? <laughs> oh, you guys keep losing me. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You're good. Oh, okay. you're good. Yeah, I keep seeing the screen go out. So uh, in that band was like Al McKay from Earth, Wind, and Fire, and I, I think there was a couple guys from Earth, Wind, and Fire. My uncle was like a session keyboard player, right? And um, just uh, just playing with everybody. So. So I kind of grew up in that environment. My I, we lived at my grandmother's house initially when I was born, and so even as a little toddler, they would, uh, you know, my uncle would say, you know, don't don't go in the band room, don't go in the band room. Oh, okay. so as soon as he left, I was out there turning on turning on every amp and hitting every drum, and me and all my little cousins, we'd just been making rackets since we were little little tiny kids, you know. I'm going to use that like reverse psychology one day when I have kids to make sure they're musicians just basically like, don't go in the studio ever and then know that that's going to propel them to go in the studio. <laughs> well, that's, you can. And, yeah. and so I, I was like clarinet saxophone in like middle school and then first chair saxophone in uh, Monrovia High School. We moved to Pasadena area by that time. And um, yeah, so I just like learned how to read music at a young age. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, just uh, my I was in Hawaii one time with my grandma on vacation. We we're visiting some relatives and, and we were at the Blaisdell Arena uh, or the outdoor. Um, oh, no, the stadium, rather, the Honolulu Stadium there. And they have this big um, uh, uh, swap meet there. So my grandma bought me my first acoustic guitar at a young age there. I wish I still had it. I gave it away to a friend when I got a better guitar. Right. But um, and. I just spent the whole time just learning how to tune it and, yeah. and you know, at first it was woodwinds and then it turned into guitar. And then I got back and I begged my mom for my first Fender Stratocaster, my first electric guitar and um, playing rhythm guitar in bands all through like high school and stuff. And then, um, yeah, then I, I, I picked up an old uh, an old Fender Tele bass that my uncle had, I bought it off him for a couple hundred bucks and I just like fell in love with the bass. It was the sexiest instrument ever for me. So 
then it was over. Then it was over. And then I played around like every club in LA um, from like from about 86 to 88. Uh, I was only at two or three bands. And then, uh, yeah, so I was over, you know, mates uh, in North, North Hollywood. I was yeah. just uh, picking up my, uh, I got a 10 string and a five string Warwick bass. I had to go pick up for some recordings. So I went by to mates yesterday. And I've been jamming at that place since 1986 when Bobby wow. just opened the place, right? So he's, he's like my brother. And um, so I was over there and his brother-in-law, uh, I was there with, with uh, one of my bands and we were just in one of the small rooms there. And his brother-in-law comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, Ozzy's around the corner, like trying out bass players. You should go. And this is like late 89. Wow. Uh, they had just got back from doing the Moscow Peace Festival that year, you okay. know? So, uh, yeah, so I, I said, uh, okay, that sounds like fun, you know? So, um, that sounds like fun. Was, yeah. <laughs> and, and I never was going to get that gig, right? Never in a million years am I getting that gig. So, um, so I got the address and turns out it was Frank Zappa's place called Joe, Joe's garage. Okay. You know? So, um, yeah, so, uh, so I'm in this beat up old truck and I, I just got promoted at my warehouse job. So I was, I called in sick to my job and, uh, I could not find fucking Joe's garage anywhere. I, I was driving around the block. I could not find it. And then I started running out of gas. I said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to go get gas and go to work. Never mind. You know, I was just, I just wanted to play like a crazy train. I don't know with Ozzy one time, you know, just to say. Okay. So luckily I ran out of gas and I pulled into this Arco station uh, on, um, on Lancashire Boulevard. So I, I pulled in there and I'm filling up the gas and I look across and I see the, uh, I see the uh, phone, a phone booth right there, and I'm like, "Well, oh, huh, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just go to the phone booth and like I'll look up the thing, Joe's Garage, and I'll call and see if it's around here." So, yeah, gas is going to my truck. I go into the the phone booth. I, I had some change, luckily, put it in there. Called up, and the guy's all. Uh, his his name was Mark Coy. I always remember this. He was Frank Zappa's monitor engineer forever, and he ran Joe's Garage. And he says, uh, he said, no, dude, you're right around the corner. You just got to turn down the alley, go this way and that way, you know? And I said, oh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll zip right over. So I, I cruise in and uh, instantly I know I'm never going to get this gig. I had like the rattiest like jeans on and like an LA Kings hockey jersey. I just I looked terrible. I was really young, like 22. Wow. And uh, so I walk in and there's guys like obviously older than me and they had all the right gear and they're all wearing like leather pants and shit. <laughs> I said, okay, well, I'm, they're obviously professionals and they obviously knew the songs better than me too. So there's about, I think 212 guys tried out at that time. Right. And so, uh, so I'm in there and I'm, I'm listening through the wall and I'm like, Oh, okay. I could tighten up that part. So I'm trying to have this old fender bass and I'm just trying to like, I'm, I'm trying to better, I don't know, and crazy train and stuff. Mm -hmm. so going and jam with Ozzy. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I uh, sit in there and then this guy named Mark Candelario, uh, who now is uh, Tool's production manager. He's, yeah. he's the head guy for Tool. And he, he was Randy Castillo's drum tech at the time. And he points at me, he's all, get in there. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. So I get up and I walk in there and I walk in the room and it's Ozzy and Sharon, Mark Candelario, and then Zach Wilde and Randy Castillo. And that was it, right? And uh, so they had been trying out guys for like a couple of weeks and I had, I had gotten in on the last couple of days, you know? And yeah. so, um, so, uh, Zach looks at me, he's like, okay, what do you want to sing? And Ozzy's I'm on the mic and everything. We, we went for it right off the bat, you know? And then, uh, I said, uh, I said, let's play crazy train. He said, okay, cool. And then he goes into, I don't know. And then I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started laughing. I'm like, okay, it's going to be like that. Huh? And, uh, you know, from the first moments we were just having a laugh, it was just a wonderful experience across the board, you know? Wow. And, yeah. And then, so, so I, I, we were jamming out and jamming out and then, uh, you know, we played four or five songs and then I remember going out to my truck and, and then I'm thinking in the back of my mind, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go to my warehouse job. It, it was a record distributor. Um, uh, we, we, we get like, you know, the, the new Bruce Springsteen skids of the new Bruce Springsteen and split it up and send it to like all the record stores. It was a one stop, okay. call it, right? I was an export yeah. manager there. This place called Pacific Coast One Stop, which isn't um, going anymore. But yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm walking, I'm just thinking about that shit now. And I'm walking to my car and I'm throwing the stuff up and in, in the back of my, my car. And then uh, 
And Sharon runs out. She's like, oh, there you are. We almost lost you. you. You know, will you come back tomorrow? You're one of the top like five guys. I was like, holy shit. Now, okay, now I'm nervous, right? Shit, <laughs> <laughs> you got you're like no way. Okay, so uh, oh, it's so fun. And then uh, so uh, so now I start. They wanted me to learn a whole bunch of songs. So now I'm really nervous, and I'm just going do, doing reps on these things. And it was about like a two week process. I kept having to go to to Joe's garage and, and, uh, just amazing place to experience all that. I got down to like a couple, like two or three guys, a couple of guys from New York and myself, and I ended up, um, winning out. But what well, the cool thing too, is like, in the we were in the big room rehearsing and in the small room at Joe's garage, uh, Dweezil had his band in there. So it was like Josh Fries on drums, Scott wow. Funis, Mike Kennelly playing guitar, just amazing musicians. Oh, you know? Yeah. And this was before Frank had passed away too, right? So it was like it was really cool to like hang out with Frank and and um, you know he he had the um, prostate cancer by that point, you know. Yeah. But it was just, just a really cool experience, you know, to be just this kid. And at that point, I've, I've I'd only played bass in a couple bands really before, um, you know, before jumping into that. And next thing Did you know, I'm, I'm I'm flying to Ireland with with Zach and Randy Castillo. And we, we uh, hold up at the Thompson Twins house in south of Dublin in this place called County Wicklow. And back then with the Aussie bands, like we, we, we'd we live at this kind of the same places, you know, we'd all live in the same house together. And it was just, uh, man, it was just such a, such a wow. heady, fun time for us, you know, it's just crazy. That's, like, that, that's that where is... it started, man. Just luckily I ran out of gas. I always you, say that, just luckily I ran out of gas. On the King's Cruise too. That's like totally in style still. So. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is like that is just like that is, that's a Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. you, you really, know I mean? My best one of my best uh, life moments in my life is uh, so I was still living with my grandparents at the time. My grandpa was riddled with prostate cancer himself at that point. Okay. Eighty six year old. Uh, he didn't last very long after that. Basically dying of um of his prostate cancer. And so uh, at the last day of, of aud auditions, right? So there was a guy from New York who Zach knew, and then there was me, and then another guy from the city of New York. One guy's from Jersey, one guy's. So I'm thinking in my mind, okay, the guy that Zach knows that he used to be in a band with, he's probably got it, right? So uh, like, uh, so uh, that guy from New York, he goes in first, and and he there's he at, the, at this point we're all sounding killer. Any one of us could have pulled that gig off, you know. We were really well rehearsed and knew knew all the songs. And then, so he goes in there for about a half hour, 45 minutes. And then it was my turn. I go in there and jam out. And then me and the other guy are in the, the waiting room at Joe's garage. And then Zach's buddy goes in from Jersey. He, he goes in, he's in there for about 45 minutes. They stop. And then now they're talking to the guy for like 20 minutes. And then he's, sure. nobody's coming out. And me and the other guy are like, all right, we totally, I, we totally didn't get this. It was yeah. awesome. Nice meeting you, bro. We traded yeah. numbers and everything. It's yeah. like, cool, all right, whenever I'm in New York, I'll look you up, you know. And then, uh, then Sharon comes out and she says, "Hey, uh, the guys are gonna make a decision. So uh, go home, and we'll call you in a while." So me and the other guy are like, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we didn't get it. We're cool, right?" So I, I go back to my grandparents' house, and my my grandpa's all, "Did you get it?" And I said, oh, "I don't think so, Grandpa." And then. Uh, so he's cooking me something to eat and we're hanging out, just me and my, my gramps. And then um, then the phone rings and it's Sharon and she says, Michael, you got the gig. Um, I'm going to put you on with Ozzy. So he puts me on with Ozzy and we start we start talking and we, we talk for a while and kind of strategizing and schedule and stuff like that. And then so I put the phone down and me and my dying 86 year old grandpa started jumping up and down like two little kids, man. It was what, like that moment was one of my uh, tear up just about yeah. it man it was like, you get me all like, gushy yeah oh, yeah. It's just one of the best moments in my life that the moment when i when when they said okay you got a job so i'm like okay cool man that is awesome. and then it turned into like you know uh it changed my life like ozzy and sharon i they're, they're I, we're still tight to this day i just owe them so much man and with them i met allison chains and the whole you know the whole yeah. thing happened and but like it changed the the whole dynamic of like my family. All of a sudden, I had like healthcare. You know, I didn't, I didn't even have fucking healthcare yeah. before. Next thing you know, I'm like in the union. I got healthcare and dental, and you know, yeah. traveling around and and uh, you know, uh, just amazing <laughs> time. You know, and the, and then I couldn't have like stumbled across greater guys like Zach Wild and Randy Castillo, just two of the nicest, sweetest guys. You know, and. Um, yeah. 
just the best. And and Ozzy's old crew, uh, a, l- a lot of them have passed away now. A lot of old, like, crusty English guys, you know. And so and that, that's kind of where I learned. Me and Zach Wilde always say we went to the University of Ozzy Osbourne, the Ozzy Osbourne Finishing School, you know. So it's, <laughs> for guys like us, it was just like, uh, and and we're so grateful and humbled still by it. We just would do anything for Ozzy, you know. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, know, I, I, you never know what stories are going to come back. Yeah. And, uh, Zach Wilde actually – this is such a weird random thing, but you mentioned his generosity. And I actually remember my sister years ago uh, had just moved to Charlotte and she was just waiting tables and just trying to make her way. And I think they came through town or whatever. And he ended up tipping her like two X the cost of the entire bill of like every, I mean, he was just like incredibly generous. Like she had no idea who he was until that happened and was just like, who is this guy? And oh, like, he's the, he, he is one of the biggest hearted people I ever met in the world. Now Ozzy's the same way, man. You see, you see people always like, writing all this crazy stuff about them. And they're just the nicest folks, man. They really are. And, you know, just, uh, you, you and I, I know, like I see your posts on Facebook, like anytime it's Ozzy's birthday or Sharon's birthday, or they're celebrating something like you're one of the first people to jump in and say, you know, I, thank you so much. I, I owe so much, so much oh, to these. You know, and if you think about, it, I mean, man, not, not to get too like philosophical, but think of all the careers that Ozzy and Sharon have launched, not just bass players, but guitar players. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a documentary on its own. Just the musicians that went through that camp, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, and then, like, uh, we played in, uh, where was it? Denmark, uh, Copenhagen. We, we did this big festival uh, called Copenhagen with Ozzy um, in 2000. I think it was 2019. And uh, so... Yeah, so I got to hang out with Ozzy all day. It was great. It was like you, you know, just like just seeing seeing a family member, you know, that you haven't seen in a while, and we just had a laugh. And 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 he was killing it that night. And Zach and Blasco and Clefados, man, they they're just a great band. And you know, it's 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 really cool. Like we all like um, I don't know. There, there's some guys that have like kind of a saltiness about it, right? They chip on their shoulder. But then there's other guys like us who are just so, so grateful, man. It's like it's a small fraternity of people that could say, yeah, we were in the Ozzy Osbourne band. It's just yeah. just, um, yeah. just a c- cool place to learn and, you know, h- how to do all this stuff, you know. And That is so cool. Yeah, and then it, it just like, God, I, I, I just uh, – I just sit there thinking about what would have happened if I had enough gas to get to the warehouse work. I would right. have that, that phone booth, you know, <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, you know, you know, that's, I mean, just for, for any, for any budding bass players out there that, that are, that are watching this, the message obviously is don't ever say no to a gig. Don't, you know, just like, just, just, just do it. Just play, yeah. just get out there and play and make yourself seen. Even yeah, if you're you'll be positive positive against that. you. Gilby Clark always said that. He was like, just say yes to everything. And then like, you could say no later. <laughs> right. if, you start, if you say no up front, then a lot of people won't call you. They'll think, oh, he's just going to say no anyways. You know, just say yes to everything. And- yeah, that's crazy, man. Hey, uh, Jay has a question. He want, and I don't know if you want to, if we want to get into this or not, but was the other bass player from Jersey, JD? That was uh, no, no, it was another guy. Uh, okay. And Zach's one of Zach's early bands, but JD is amazing bass player and one of my bros in life. Yeah, because I, I, I sat in with, um, I did 2001 Ozfest with, with Zach. Yeah, he was in between bass players and okay. he, calls, he calls me Skank. Hey, Skank, <laughs> hop a flight to Indianapolis. I'll pick you up at the airport. We'll do Ozfest with the boss. It's like, okay, cool, man. So um, it was uh, Ozzy, it was Black Sabbath. Who was it? it? Was Sabbath, um, Marilyn Manson, Lincoln Park, uh, Disturbed, Slipknot. Um, I think I'm missing a couple, maybe. And and then Black Label. We were in the main stage acts, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so it was so funny. So I I jumped on a flight and I grabbed a couple of bases. I didn't even know the songs, and and I just flew into Indianapolis Airport and then tour bus tour bus pulls up and then Zach st- sticks a beer out the window uh, out the door and cracks the beer and goes like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was like, okay, here we go. So I, I grabbed the beer and walked on the tour bus and then, you know, we learned the songs and then we off we went to, you know, and it was just such a fun tour. And it was a fun tour to, to like, um, 
to be in and not have to play last with Ozzy, you know, and it was like the pressure was off. So we were like a bunch of just dudes on summer camp on Ozfest. It was so great, you know, just that we were the the, the children that could get away with murder because we knew everybody on the tour, you know, and, and all the crew guys and everything. We knew, we knew where the, the stacks of, of backstage passes were and we knew, we knew what drawer <laughs> they were in and stuff like that, you know. So we knew we weren't going to get in that much trouble because Ozzy and Sharon loved us, you know. So, right, right. Yeah, as long as yeah, so if, fun, if you're you able know? to disclose on here, what is the best tour prank that you've either pulled or had pulled on you that you can recall? Wow, here's one. Here's a great one. Um, so I won't tell who the band is, right? But they were assholes, and uh, <laughs> and, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't in Aussie band. This was during Alice in Chains, right? And uh, they they we only played a couple shows with them at some festival run, and this was like late nineties. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what tour it was, but oh, I lost you guys again. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, no. yeah. yeah you're good. So um, yeah, so so. We were like, what can we do to these guys, man? These fucking guys are just so irritating. So we bought a big bag of crickets from the pet store. <laughs> oh, no. And we went in their tour bus when they weren't looking, and we let all these crickets out, like hundreds of crickets in their tour bus. So as soon as the lights go out, all the crickets start making a bunch of noise. <laughs> and oh, of course, the bus, the bus driver wanted to kill us, but, you know. <laughs> Oh, what I think that was one of the greatest pranks ever. Is uh, that goes down as one of the best yeah, I've ever that's, heard. That's evil, right? That <laughs> is cool. Oh, damn. I mean, my, my, my oh, they're crickets. It could, it could have been, it could have been way worse than that. Dude, but my, 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 no, my, my <laughs> daughter has a, has a bearded dragon, she feeds this thing crickets and she buys them by like the hundred, but and she keeps them in a cricket tank. And they're loud. One of those bastards gets out. It's like we tear all the bedrooms apart looking for this damn thing. <laughs> they're loud. Like you say, as soon as the lights go out, you'd be laying in bed here. <laughs> she let one of the crickets on. I'm going to kill her. You know? <laughs> oh, that is cool. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, some, there's a lot brilliant. of worse ones than that. There's a lot of worse ones than that. Like, <laughs> like uh, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, I've, I've I've heard of some really crazy stuff, especially with crew guys that don't like other crew guys. Oh yeah, they'll they'll do some really wicked evil stuff with, yeah, wow. body wow. fluids and stuff. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. So. so from so from from Ozzy, did you? How long was it between Ozzy and Heart? We I obviously oh, you know well, well uh, we finished the No More Tears uh, tour, and then we went to a place called Granny's. Uh, that's not there anymore. The studio up in, um, it was in, uh, I think it was in Reno, Nevada. Okay. So we went there for a while. And uh, then we ended up coming back to LA to mix, uh, I think Michael Wagner mixed the double live album, the Live and Loud record. Okay. And, uh, so that was, we just wanted to do something for the tour. It's such an, it was like, it was like basically Motorhead and Ozzy Osbourne band for that whole tour. And um, we had other bands coming and going and stuff, but those were the main two bands. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted something to like remember the tour by. And Sharon's all, okay, we sh we got to do a live um, album with this thing. So we we did it. We we actually got Ozzy his first um, his first Grammy was on don't I don't want to change the world for, off the live album 1993. He got the, okay. he got that one. So we were mixing that. We got off the road. We're mixing that. Uh, I mean, I wasn't doing much. I was just sitting in a room listening, but I, you know, like I wasn't mixing the record, but I was there. <laughs> there you know. well, I'm sure the bass didn't go where it typically does, which is about 60 feet lower than it should be. <laughs> no, I, was, I was probably not even doing that. I was just sitting around, probably just eating, eating free food and having a laugh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and watching Michael Wagner work, which is amazing. Right. right? He's, right. he's a master, you know, uh, I think he just retired too. Bummer, but um yeah, so we're doing that and we're mixing. And then um, at the end of that tour, uh, these crazy guys from Seattle opened it open up for us on the last leg of the tour, which was Allison Chains. And they had just released the Dirt record. Okay. And so they were in Hawaii and I was with, with uh, we were, we're working on that double live album. And then um, I get a call from Sean Kinney. He says, hey, uh, uh, Mike wants to, wants to leave the band. Do you want to play Rock and Rio? And I said, you know, to fill in, I said, okay, yeah, the, okay, what do I got to do? And then he said, well, I, I'll put you on with our manager, Susan Silver. So Susan talked to me. She's, okay, we need you to get these, 
um, five vaccinations to go down there. So I go down to LAX, there's a hospital there. So they gave me all this, like, look like uh, radiator fluid. <laughs> so they, put, they fill me up full of the radiator fluid. And then they said, and then uh, they said, go home and we'll give you your flight information. So I went home and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then, um, so they finally called and they said, uh, well, Mike wants to do the last shows with rock with them at rock and Rio. And, and it was, um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Alice in Chains, and um, Nirvana, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> I, and 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 now I'm like, you motherfuckers! I just put all this ra the radiator fluid in me, man. You know. <laughs> so, and then uh, they said, no, meet us in London. Meet us in London, and and just fill in. And and at this point, you know, um, because I was real fond of Mike. I was real fond of the guy. I loved him. We had a great time on tour and everything. So, uh, so I said. Uh, Okay, cool. So I, um, I, I told Ozzy and I said, I said, well, um, Hey, the Allison chains guys asked me to fill in, but I don't want to leave you hanging, dude, if we got shit to do, you know, and, and, and he, he, this quote will stick with me the rest of my life. He looks me right in the eye and he says, if you don't go, we have to go to the hospital. And I said, Oh, why is that? And he says, because it's going to take me, it's going to take him about a week to get my foot out of your ass. That's what Ozzy said to me, right? And I just gave him a big hug. And I said, oh, thanks, man. And so I flew up to London. We did three rehearsals. <clears throat> we actually had scheduled three rehearsals, but we just kind of, they were so smoked from going flying all the way from Hawaii to Brazil and then Brazil to London. So the first day we did, we just kind of sat around and smoked some hash <laughs> and, and uh, didn't do much. And then um, the, uh, so the, 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 uh, Second day, we got into it. Second, third day, um, two rehearsals, and then it turned into. If you include the Jules Holland um, show, we did 27 gigs in 32 days in 16 countries, and that was with um, uh, that was with um, Screaming Trees opening up that band, the Screaming Trees. Yeah. So, and that's how, that was my, my like trial by fire. You know, I remember the first show in London and uh, I'm up on stage and I, there were so many songs. Right. And uh, so I'd be up on stage and uh, Lane would go, all right, this is a song called like Junkhead or whatever. Right. And then I go, and then, I'm, and then I'd go up to Lane. I'm like, Hey, which one's Junkhead? And then he'd go like this and he'd sing it to me off the mic. Okay. Ah, okay. I got it. Hit it. And I look at Sean. <laughs> like I didn't even know wow. some, of some of the songs yet. You know, I, and, I definitely know that feeling of like, just you learn so many songs in a short period of time and like title wise, you're like, that means nothing to me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God Lane, Lane saved me on those first few shows, you know, and then, wow. uh, yeah, so we did UK first and then jumped over and over into Europe and, um, yeah, it was just nuts and back to England and did the Jules Holland show, uh, I think to end it. And yeah, it's just like, so that's how it started. And then, uh, I came back home and then, um, you know, at this point I was just, I was just filling in waiting for Mike to come back, but then he never did. And they said, well, Hey, do you want to just be in the band? And I said, cool. And that was January. I'm 90, uh, January 93 as when okay. I, when I went to Europe with them. And then I think, um, yeah, I just moved up to Seattle at that point. And, and then that year, um, we did, uh, uh, jar flies record. Like we were torn, like some shitty cities tour, we call it, you know, when you're playing sea markets and stuff. And, then we, we got off the road and we had about 10 days in between tours. And so we just booked some time at London Bridge and none of us had anything. I think Jerry had one song called Don't Follow, but the rest of it was just like on the spot. We just went into London Bridge and 10 days later, mixed and mastered and written uh, wow. in 10 days with Jar of Flies came out, you know, we wow. came out of that. And then we went on, um, I think it was, uh, oh, Lollapalooza 93. So it was us and... Primus, Rage Against the Machine, Tool, Babes in Toyland, Dinosaur Jr., you know, Fishbone. Yeah. Who was the best band of that tour, I thought, you know, just. Yeah, uh, yeah. We all yeah. thought that, yeah. There was no better live band in the world than Fishbone on a good night, man. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Wow. I can't, I can't in 10 days. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it was just, we just got super, super lucky, you know. We just, uh, <laughs> you know, I had a couple ideas. Um, uh, I Stay Away. Uh, was one of mine and Rotten Apple, and then of course, of course, you know, it wouldn't have been Rotten Apple or I Stay Away without without the rest of the guys. You know, we sure. wrote a, wrote it together, you know, and then yeah. uh, 
Gary came up with uh, no excuses, just off the cuff, you know, and um, yeah, it's just like, that's that, you know? yeah, Nutshell came out of that. Oh, I would say that's the heaviest Alice in Chains song is Nutshell. Just wow. so heavy. Yeah, Lane, Lane just put everything on the line on that one, you know. You got to figure this. got to be like, you know, obviously like four guys can go into a studio and, and, and force out, you know, a CD or an album's worth of songs. But to do that, there's got to be obviously there's there's that chemistry you know what i mean there's, there's, there's a human chemistry that you guys everybody's firing on all eight cylinders and everybody's you know that chemistry is just working together there's a trust thing too you know what i mean yeah yeah. You know, yeah i never had to worry like that the drums were bad or anything or that you know or, or that sean wasn't going to come up with something just amazingly cool and inspirational and then lane is lane of course there's only one of him and, right. and jerry is just the riff king and you know Man. but that, that was a cool album because it showed like a different side of the band they had, they had a, um uh the sap ep was an acoustic kind of vibe too you know but so that's what's really cool about it it's like like it was cool to have two sides of the band you know yeah, and yeah. We, still yeah. Do acoustic. we just played acoustic up um they gave us a museum of pop culture award there at the mopop um thing this last year so yeah. we went up yeah. and we played a couple acoustic songs during during covid and, and it's fun, so funny, all those guys in those bands came to support us. You know, Fishbone came, Metallica came wow. and played, and um, Les from Claypool, Les, Les Claypool from Primus, and all, you know, just all of our friends came out for that. Mastodon dudes and Corn and um, City wow. and Color guy, Dallas Green, did an amazing version of Rain When I Die. And yeah. so it's just, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there's like a, yeah, I think it's a trust thing, and, and maybe that's part of chemistry, you know? Yeah. I mean, but, like you hear, you hear that in, in some of these great albums, like the Beatles were just like, so I mean, I'm not comparing us to the Beatles by any chance. Yeah. Just went in and went to work and just we're recording and there's no demos. These are the real tracks. Yeah, right. They just went in to, to get something at the end of the day. I think there's something to that. I think what's the famous story of uh, the Nevermind album at Sound City was what, 16 days. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something to deadlines, you know? And, yeah. Uh, it's like, you're saying trusting each other, but it's almost like trusting yourself to know, like you're gonna let that cat out of the bag. And it's like, you're, you're just trusting like, this is us, this is our sound and people can't do what we're doing and we're not trying to do what other people are doing. And there's and, and and down I, I don't even think it's that, that much thought going, mainly I was just like, you know, you're just in there scared shitless too, you know? <laughs> so I, think there, I think there's something to that, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, <laughs> people are paying attention and yeah flies, we did 10 days work and then and then uh toby wright mixed it up we went to electric ladyland in new york and mixed it up and then when the thing came out it was like the, the first ep in the history of the billboard charts that went to like number one and oh. um and we were blown we were laughing about it it's like shit well maybe we should have spent like you know 18 days on it instead of 10. Right. <laughs> we, knew, <Right. laughs> we knew it was gonna be that like um you know people are going to be listening that much. We just thought it was something to do in between records, you know? Yeah. And look what comes out of it. Wow. Yeah. So that that's a big secret for young people. You just got to do it, man. And especially with this technology, you could, you could do records at your house and, and it's just, uh, yeah, put it up the flag. It's easy to put it up the flagpole now, you know, yeah. True. Yeah. harder to make money at it though, but it's still, it's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, man, what a great, I mean, we're doing this zoom stuff and, uh, uh, right yard and it's just like what what a great uh what a and, and, and like these kids now you look at them on youtube i wish i had bass lessons or guitar right. lessons on YouTube. Right. just um, any song you want to learn there's somebody giving you a lesson on how to play that song or even if you want to get into theory you know there's so many like uh um like uh, my buddy steve stein you know doing the yeah. lessons online i mean there's yeah. so many ways to access music yeah and, yeah and how to do this stuff and I mean, even if it's like buying a piece of gear for your studio and learning how to use it, there's a there's a YouTube video that will teach you how to do this stuff. You know, it's just amazing. I wish I had that when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like records back and forth and Black Sabbath records, you know, yep. thousands oh, of times trying to learn how to play, you know, when the levee breaks or whatever, you know. <laughs> it's oh, like, yeah. yeah. Even really down to, um, to setting up guitars, like, I mean, for as, half my life I've been playing music and it's getting to the point now where it's like, I can't afford to just like, have somebody upkeep all my guitars like i need to learn how to do this myself and plus i would just like like being able to tweak something in a setup 
So like the other weekend, I just like sat and watched YouTube tu tutorials. I'm like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stay patient. I'm gonna, and now I'm like, oh, this and is incredible. The they're like, so good. I, I was watching. Uh, I think I posted something the other day on my my personal. You're on the on the personal um, uh, page there. You know, but, um, that little little kid from South Africa. That's right. Oh man, what a monster drummer! He's like Benny Caliuta or something. Just yeah. a monster drummer. He's like probably twelve years old, eleven years old, and just killing. He just had that thing, man. Where he's oh, feel, yeah, oh, such a yeah. good, good drummer, and just like that. That gives me hope, you know. Yeah, yeah. But the flip side is too. I, I bet there's a Kurt Cobain in high school somewhere that is going to go. Oh man, I I'm going to get out of music because there's no money to be made here. This I can't have, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll go start a app or a CEO or, or yeah. else besides music, you know? So it's all about who's got the heart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, like, like you said, I, you got to run it up the flagpole and, and you, you got, you, you kind of have to be fearless about it too. Like you got to have a, I don't give a shit what anybody feels or thinks or, you know, people like it great. If people don't like it, I'm I'm not afraid if they're going to critique it or because you know, especially now, you know, the, the internet's still the wild west where there's a lot of key what I call keyboard bravado. People <laughs> behind their keyboard just kind of like pooping on everybody else. But it's like, yeah. well, dude, then you do it. You know, if if you don't think that's good, then then let's see you put a video out and put it in front of tens of thousands of people. And yeah, I used to think like okay, that the intent is a lot to do with music. I'm doing this for, you know, the, my mission plan is this, right. And yeah. then you quickly realize that when you do that, like, okay, yeah, you got that mission plan, but your manager has a different mission plan. <laughs> yeah. your company has a different mission plan or, um, or like say you're doing a soundtrack stuff. So that, movie people and the director and uh like we've done like um scoring some movies with michael came in we did an arnold schwarzenegger movie okay did a couple wow. songs on that but we actually got to go jam with michael came in at uh dave stewart's house in the valley here from the eurythmics they're beautiful yeah. stuff over there. and so we went over there and uh like but you quickly realize like oh wait like the the director has its whole like it's so weird. So it's it's all like what angle you look at it, you know. Yeah. So yeah. you could get lost in all that stuff, trying to please all these other people around. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's it's yeah. nice to kind of uh, and and whenever we get like that, we we each have we have each other to turn to, like me and Jerry and Sean and William. Sure. And, you know, we 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 just like kind of like wait, hold on, let's take a breath here. Like what what are we? You know, especially when yeah. we got the band back together, those are big questions. You know, like what are we? Yep. Are yep. Doing this shit, you know, are we, are we yeah. going to do another record or, um, yeah. you know, so, you know, thank God we did. <laughs> any, um, any obvious, obviously with COVID and everything, but I'm, I'm sure you guys are like aching, aching to get back out on the road and, and do some touring or are you recording first? Well, we did, we did, um, uh, the Rainier Fog record. We did that up in Seattle and then, sure. um, we started the tour. Uh, we did an acoustic set at the top of the Space Needle, and I think that was two, 2017, 2018. Okay. And we ended the tour in Seattle. Um, we did 31 countries in between those two shows, and we uh, we ended. I think it was November of 2019. Uh, okay. October, November, somewhere in there. So we were going to take 2020 off, anyways. Yep. And William had an acoustic um, solo record he, he has out now, I think. And he was going to tour Europe with it. I think he had 21 country tour book, you know, just him and one acoustic guitar and, a, and a, an assistant. And then Jerry's going to work on a solo record. And then, which I think he's, I think he's coming up, to come, uh, almost completed that, I think now or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, let's see. Yeah. So we we're going to take the year off 2020. And then, so me and my wife, we bought a new house and, um we moved in had our first christmas there and then i had about a million air miles like no shit like a million air miles on american airlines and my wife's never been to italy so i was like okay well let's just blow this whole million miles and we'll just go to italy so we had this trip booked all through italy and uh uh so we we're gonna go mid-february and then um and then the comedian bill burr and um dean del rey and mark Marin. Like, so they have a side band that plays ACDC songs. So they do these concerts where they do like two hours of comedy 
and then they get up and then they they hire all their 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 buddies come up and play so the band was like me and dave lombardo and oh, like uh, awesome. brad wilk and <laughs> juliet lewis came and and um uh billy ray uh, uh billy uh billy rowe he's playing in buck cherry now he was in that oh, band Jet Boy. and then um uh a uh, Gorman from the drummer from Black Crows, he flew in, and Scott, um, Scott, the guitar player, Rival Sons, and so like, like that was the band. So we just did like an hour, hour and a half of ACDC. So I told my wife, I said, let's um, uh, let's like let's put the trip off, and we'll we'll go after this gig. So, um, so I learned the songs, went down there, and we had a great night, and that was March the tenth. Uh, 2020 yeah. and then la shut down march 11th that's when everything they said hey this COVID thing's for real and they just shut everything down in la yeah. and then all of these like death numbers started coming in from italy they said oh italy's the worst that's oh, yeah. the place and and all these people are dying so yeah once again pa power of rock and roll man i just wanted to jam some acdc <laughs> and wow. oh, i to save my, mine and my wife's life who knows man right like, Right. Yeah, some bands that were over there, some heavy bands, that friends of mine like Death Angel and um, Testament, they were over there. I was talking to Chuck Billy about it the other day. They all came back with COVID, and they were that was right um, February, March 2020. So, yeah, because uh, uh, Testament's drummer came back. He was like very sick for for a long time from yeah, it. Yeah, I think uh, no, I think that was Will, the drummer of Death Angel. Yeah, he was on a ventilator for like six weeks. That's right. Oma. That's right. Wow. Yeah, so that's that's when I realized it's for real. I had another buddy named Hal Wilner, who was the uh, musical producer of Saturday Night Live since the early days, right? He was a buddy of ours and he passed away early on. So um, I I knew it was pretty serious. I, I have Filipino family members who are nurses and I knew it was really serious early on. So yeah. me and my wife just said, okay, well, we're just gonna hang out here and and then that's when I made the decision, like, okay, I'm going to build a drum room then at my house. So I got a live drum, drum room on um, about 40, 47 feet by about uh, 20, 22 feet wide, you know. And I just said, well, I need a live room for amps and stuff and drum sets. I, I want to do it for real. I just didn't want to sit around, like, making demos with a Kemper for a right. year and a half. Right. You know? oh. So, yeah, I got to work and we floated the floor, floated the wall. Oh, sure. You know, it was, I did like the Sound City kind of thing, 11, 11 inch like rock wool walls, and yep. uh, it, it was oh. for real, so none of the neighbors can complain. But uh, oh, I'm envious! That's awesome. And yeah, so we, we did that. So I, 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 that is all I've been doing really this past year is I, I wake up and I, I just go swimming and hang out with the dogs and the wife and um, just yeah. make my way to eat, eat something, make my way downstairs, and I just got all these guitars and amps and. I've turned into the reamp king. I've I've learned how to reamp now, you know. <laughs> so oh, wow, okay. Turned me into actually a good engineer. I've just been tinkering this whole time, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I just just plugging away at music. I got probably um oh, I'm, I'm probably gonna start on my fourth hard drive now, full of stuff. So I've been doing this for the last year and a half, and 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 it's cool because there is no mission plan. I'm just like cer certain weeks will be all acoustic music. Yep. And then, or I'll go through like a, uh, I'm going to play rhythm, funky rhythm guitar for a week or, you know, or I'm yeah. gonna, I got one, one stiff arm white boy funk, funk beat. I'm going to go play the drums on that and then I'm going to put something on it, you know, and, like, and then there's heavy stuff and there's grungy stuff and there's like, um, like a, a real, like a spacey kind of, you know, I'm just kind of all over the map and it's just nice to, this is the first time in 31 years of doing this that I, I've had this opportunity to just have a full blown studio and just, just experiment yeah. and have no deadline and no like, oh, this is going to be on a record or this is going to be yeah. on a record. It's just like, it's just you like, agree. yeah, it's just. You create it. Yeah. And that, now I'm at this point now, everybody's getting like um, vaccinated now. So and they're starting to open up LA. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to get like some of my drummer buddies over soon. And, you know, the room's big enough where we could throw jams at the house now. So I, I've just been gearing up for that just so. Cool. And if anybody yeah. has any, like, uh, if anybody asks for songs, I'm like, oh, well, here I go. Here's four hard drives worth of shit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever. yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, I mean. So I was on the Daryl's house show. Where it's going to be Mike's house now is the next uh, rendition. You know, Mike's Mike's house. House. Oh, yeah, yeah. My wife doesn't have <laughs> too many visitors, though. Yeah. She's Seriously, like, man. Stick a camera up in the corner and just videotape <laughs> some of these things. You never know. You know? Yeah. She's 
my wife would never go for it. She's a she's a tough tough New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> when I got married, when I got married, twenty one years together. But when I got married, the first uh, the, the, as soon as I said I do, I realized I was not the boss anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, tell me, like, man, I know that feeling. Hey, speaking of milestones, mm -hmm. and I know we discussed it. I don't know if Tom was on by that point, but it is your birthday tomorrow. It is. Wow. Awesome. Can we sing you happy birthday? <laughs> oh, you <Yeah>. start. <laughs> Tom, you start. I'll, I'll, I'll harmonize. <laughs> no, seriously, man. Ha I'll, I'll spare you my happy birthday voice. But, uh, <laughs> happy birthday, yeah. man. You look, happy you look birthday. You know, as Thank always, you look 50, awesome. 55. And I was telling you before we got out, so out of the 55 years, I mean, <clears throat> endorsing and playing ampegs for 31 of those 55 years. So That's thank right. you, dude, for everything. Uh, God. I, I, I feel like I've been with the company for, for 55 years, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember Ken, Ken Hensley um, <clears throat> showed up in Aussie rehearsal at um, third encore. And he, he, um, I just showed up at rehearsal one day. There was two, um, the seven band SVTs, the yeah. rack mounted S remember oh, the yeah. seven bands? Yeah. And then, um, with with uh, four eight ten cabinets, that was my first Ken's all here. These are yours. Use Ampeg for the tour. Wow! It's like oh cool, far out, you know. Yep, yep, yep. And then, man, it's fun. I, I think I post it or we share it every now and then. You sitting on top of your, and I think this was your old Alice in Chains rig. It was right. Yeah, two, two or four eight by tens. On top of, I think four or six, like eighteens. Yeah, that's the small. That was the medium one. So I had four eighteens and then two eight tens on their side. That's when Allison. That's when we were just like trying to be the loudest band in the world. I would love to have heard that, felt that, and that was all live. Oh yeah, yeah. And Jerry had, had you know four or six stacks going at one time. I mean, we, we were trying to compete with Metallica. Wow. <clears throat> Yeah, so, we, yeah, we had, um, one tour, we were going to open for Metallica doing stadiums. Let's see. <clears throat> I had six 18s, 12 15s, and 24 10s. Wow. All going. All and, going. Yeah, that was a tour that got canceled. We never, we never got to do that tour. But that was my rig we put together for that tour. And then I had it for rehearsals at the Moore Theater. And then we never did the tour. And I've never plugged in that many cabinets since, but boy, it was glorious. God, my my clothes were just like oh, doing incredible. in front of it. It was amazing. That is awesome. <laughs> I miss I big rigs. What happened to what happened to big rigs, dude? Oh, Everything's oh, like, well, you know. Yeah. Now people uh, like are lucky to get one eight ten on stage with in ears and everything. That's yeah. where we're at now with Allison Chains and the corn tour we just did. There were so many like moving lights and video stuff everywhere. So we couldn't really have like backline anymore so it was all in ears and i had my uh my ampeg wedges i used you know and um so that, that was kind of nice with the two tens up front to give it a little bit of feel but yeah for a bass player Just straight in ears uh, yeah i don't know I, I will always but of course i grew up with with uh four eight ten cabinets in the ozzy band going all the time even at rehearsals you know so yeah, right, right. I, don't know. I was talking to tony franklin about that it's like where are the big rigs where are they they're yeah. There are no bands using big rigs anymore like that, you know? Well, that's, you know, and it's funny you say that because, I mean, this is a discussion that Dom and I have all the time when it comes to prop album. It's like, you know, who's 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 going to clean stages and, you know, pr production companies that are going to clean stages and they, they want more of a set decoration than they want, you know, Marshall's on one side and Ampeg's on the other side type of, type of vibe. I'm I'm and then there's the, the singer problem too. Singers are always like, you're too loud. <laughs> no, I'm curious if that'll change. I'm not even sure we need singers, guys, to be honest. <laughs> I'm curious if that'll change post COVID, if, like with the ramp up. I feel like people are going to have towards going to concerts eventually and just needing like raw sound. And um, I, I want to get to this question before I, I have another question that kind of ties into that. Go ahead. Uh, from Eric, he, he's let me asking. get my nicotine gum out of my uh, mouth. <laughs> Does he, can you talk briefly ago. about your effects chain, your choice of strings, and uh, what Ampeg you typically go through? Which we kind of just talked about that in terms of rigs, but yeah, yeah, I kind of um, <clears throat> it, it, well, first of all, my choice of strings is D, the Dean Markley, um, those uh, uh, the cryogenic ones, mm -hmm. no, steels. Yeah, the blue steels. I got them here somewhere. And you you've been playing those strings for as long as I can remember yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, 
I'm, I'm so like um, loyal to the people that like helped me out when I you know, first started, you know, and they were one of them. Yeah. Uh, a guy named Rich Friedrich. I don't know if you remember Rich. Yeah. Oh, Rich signed me to the, to my first, like oh, that was like, my first big thing was God rest his soul, man. Yeah. What, what a wonderful guy. I just always loved, loved Rich and yep. the old Dean Markley people. And the new people are great too. Yeah. And for effects, I'm really not using a, a whole lot of stuff. I got, um, I got the new, um, some new um, uh, Fishman Fluence pickups. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so they took my Moonburst bass that Ozzy bought me in the early 90s, and it had um, a fake uh, – Zach Wilde used to pour beer on my head <laughs> during the shows. and oh. so it zipped out my, <laughs> it zipped out, uh, my, um, my uh, pickups one day. So uh, Chris Kanzi uh, was my tech at the time who is now um, Roger Waters' production manager. You know, it's great. All the crew guys like Ascend, too, as you go through a career. You know, it's really cool to see. That's cool. So he went down to a local music place, and he bought a set of EMGs off the rack, and they put it in. Okay. And then it turns out I, I've been – and I had an EMG endorsement for years and years, and we were always trying to match that one tone. And then it, we come to find out that there was a, a dude that was selling fake EMGs in Germany. This was in Europe when, when I was there when, when the, it zipped out. And – um. So it was a fake EMG set, apparently, right? And then so we could never – and I even – I showed it to the EMG guys and said, no, that's we, – we don't use that preamp. I don't know what that is. And said EMG wow. on it. But then they came around later and said it was one of theirs. I'm like, well, shit, why didn't you send them out then to me a long time ago? I could have been yeah. – the tone I've been chasing. So uh, Fishman has this new technology now where uh, they, I gave them the – I was in Boston, so I went by the factory with the, with the, the one base, that the magic base. And I use on every record. And so we we put it on this machine and it shows the throw of the magnets off the off the actual pickups, right? right. And then what Fishman does is they there's this layered system they use and they they custom it. So only that is coming out of your um so they uh, they match the throw of the pickup exactly. Huh. Uh, yeah, so then we 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 did the prototypes, and I went into the studios uh, with them. There's this uh, genius named Frank Falbo. You know Frank Falbo. So uh, me and Frank and um, uh, Ken Susi over at Fishman, all these dudes. We yep. went in the studio, and Paul Figueroa, who's uh, um, engineered our last three records and knows what that bass is supposed to sound like. So we went into uh, these studios, real nice studios here in LA, and and uh, we 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 a beat them. And then so we had this computer hooked up to these slide-in pickups that go in the back part of this P base, right? Okay. Yeah. So it's hooked up to a computer, and then I play on that for a while, and then we we capture it, and then we plug in the regular moonburst bass that I always play, and then we do that and capture it. And we just spent like weeks tweaking it. So it's a I mean that we will never we will never get closer than what it is now. So I just got my first uh, seven. We've been selling the sets since uh, two NAMM shows ago. Okay. Uh, it, we debuted them at that NAMM show. But then um, I had two uh, we, two Warwicks, three Warwicks that had th those pickups in it. And our sound guys were loving it. It's just so consistent and awesome. Then I, I went to Ventura yesterday and got, got some of the new ones. So... I just got it. This is a 1989 or 90 Warwick. That okay. Up Ooh, yeah. Sparkle, amazing. Oh yeah, I got a moon, a sparkle moon burst now. So that's oh, incredible. Oh, it's going the wrong way. There we go. Cool. Very yeah. cool. That's yeah. So, that's a big part of my sound right there. I, I'm, okay. I'm not really an effects guy. I, I am in the studio, but like like for live, I I just when people start running a lot of pedals. Yeah. It just like the, the bass tone's getting thin. If you don't really know what you're doing with those pedals, I mean, you know about this, you know, yeah. A lot of guys don't even know how to use like some of the distortion pedals or they're compressing yep. right or, or they don't know how to like put them in the right order. Yep. You know? Yep. And the bass tone just, just gets small. It, it yep. really easy. Okay. So. And I'm then they wonder, person. why is my sound sound weird? Like, right. What's yeah. up with my sound? I wonder, maybe it's the battery. And then, you know, and then they're then they're emailing me saying, "Hey, what's the input impedance on an SVT7 Pro? Because I think that might be the problem with my sound. It's like, it's not the input impedance; it's all that stuff you have in your signal chain. Yeah, or using a two dollar cable, you know, or you know, it's like even cabling. Yeah. And we're kind of persnickety, me and my tech. We, we I've had the same tech for twelve years, so we know what it's supposed to sound like. You know, you know, Scotty with the dreadlocks. Uh, the I love Scotty. Oh, uh, yeah. In fact, his older his older brother was my um was my Ampeg rep. Before you, brother was my mentor for artist relations, 
I'll, ta- I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick funny story. I was the first year I was working for Ampeg as a part time like demo work. I got off the plane in L.A. I flew in from Boston to L.A. and I was on the shuttle going down to Anaheim, and this dude sitting next to me, long dreads, uh-huh. and and and. I, I think I had like an Ampeg bag or something. And he looks over, he goes, are you going to the Am show? I said, yeah. He says, what are you doing? I says, I'm, I'm working for Ampeg. He goes, oh, really? He says, you work for Ampeg? I says, well, I'm part-time. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a demonstrator for him. I'm not really. And he, and he, and he said, um, he goes, you know, Steve Dockraden. I said, yeah, I know Steve. I just met him last time I was out in St. Louis. He goes, he's my brother. So that like, and that was. 17 18 years ago almost 20 years ago that i met scott on the on the like super shuttle going from la down to anaheim so smart and he, he did uh he worked on the last tool record he worked on the last record for us i mean he's good and good in the studio too and he's just yeah. like it was so funny uh we were at lowell georgia's place on lancashire um from can he you know had a yeah. uh rehearsal place so we we're we we're doing and i didn't have a tech my my tech pete went off to go work for rage against the machine Right. And so I was left without a tech. And then uh, so Chuck, my road manager, brings Scotty in. He's all, oh, you know, my brother. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. And Scotty had long dreadlocks and and walks in and he, he looks like a like a like a predator monster kind of, you know, he's got that. <laughs> like, who the fuck's this guy? So anyway, he, he walks in and um, and I, I just got a sense of humor instantly. Right. And then I said, well, don't tell anybody I'm not a very good bass player. And he's all, that's okay. Cause I'm a shit tech. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, I said, well, okay. Don't tell anybody we'll get along fine. And we've been together 12 years now. We've been all over the world. We've probably played in 50 countries together. He's one of my best friends in the world. You know, I just like, I don't do anything without him. You know, he's just the best. <laughs> that is so awesome, man. That is like, so like I said, I'm so loyal to my relationships too. Like, you know, with Ampeg, 30 years, D Markley, 31 years. And uh, they were the first ones to just sign me up. And EMG, I was with them almost 25, 30 years, you know, until recently. And yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, Warwick, you've been with Warwick for how long? Oh, Warwick since 1990? Yeah. 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 89, maybe 89 or 90. Yeah. And then um, Sans Amp is the only like distortion pedal I use live, really. Okay. You know, just yeah. a little bit hands amp in there and uh, especially i use that mainly for the in-ears trying to get some vibe out of it yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. Once, once again i miss the big rigs ah yeah. i miss the rigs yeah. is that an yeah. original 69 svt behind you 70 maybe yeah this one I, bu- I bought this one off of um the van halen camp yeah so this was this was actually i think i think they were telling me it was used on some recordings on the early albums and stuff so i, I gotta ask mike anthony about that yeah but, yeah uh, I bought these off Matty Bruck. He's uh, Eddie's guy, you know? Okay. I yep. grew up in Pasadena, so I, I go back t- to 82 to the Van Halen camp because I knew all the little brothers, Mike Mike Anthony's little brothers. And um, my mom had a uh, beauty salon in Pasadena, and it, it was in this, like, strip mall, and she shared a wall with Dr. Roth's optometry shop, right? So, I mean, I go so far back with the Van Halens and stuff, you know? Wow. At 10 or 11 years old, I was riding my bike t- to go watch Van Halen play at backyard parties on like these rich guys' tennis courts in San Marino and stuff. You know? <laughs> and that's how Van Halen got good. That's that's when you could like have a backyard party and people could would come and and like it wouldn't end up in a gang shooting. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> it was just such, such an amazing time that at 80s LA was like the place. You know, like okay. ni- 90s was like Seattle was a place, but yeah. in 80s, man, that like. It was just popping. It was just popping here. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's ring is ringing. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Somebody's got an Amazon delivery. No, I think that's my exterminator. You know, <laughs> he's come to get rid of us, Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give me a minute. I just got to have him spray because I found a black widow in my mailbox. Let me tell him to go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Take care of that. Maybe crickets somewhere too. <laughs> oh, that's. <laughs> man that is could you imagine unleashing like a box of crickets in somebody's tour bus i just i like the tour bunk i'm a claustrophobic person but for some reason the tour bunk is like the most sacred yeah restful sleep pe- peaceful sleep yep. i've ever gotten in my entire life yep you no know, to think of like shutting that curtain having like this much room and then hearing like crickets everywhere <laughs> i'd be freaking out that would freak me out yeah freak me out yeah, we'll have to ask Mike when he comes back. Hope you're well. What's your favorite song to play? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry about that, guys. I found yeah, Black no Widow. 
I found a black widow in my uh, in my mailbox, and I wanted to bite my wife. I'm never here to end of that one. <laughs> yeah, right. No, you don't want. Yeah, especially when they start intruding. Uh, you know, in your mailbox where you're sticking your hands. Yeah. You know? Mike, um, Andy here has a question for you. What's your favorite song to play? And of course, he says, "Stay, hope you're well. Stay, stay, stay safe. Take care." Uh -huh. For me, I'm the metal head of the band, right? I love the heavy, fast stuff. Damn that river, we die young. Um, I've been getting off on playing that the title track to Rainier Fog. It's just such a driving riff, you know. And yeah. and I'm I'm kind of the same way with um with uh, in the Aussie band. I like the I like the heavy, fast stuff. Bark at the moon, and um, you know, uh, just just the driving heavy, fast stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And like, uh, it, but that's what makes a band, you know. One guy likes a heavy, fast stuff, and another guy likes, you know. And then it's a chemistry, everything. But sure, it kind of changes every day too, depending on the tone you're getting and the the setting of the concert, or uh, whether you're playing acoustic or, you know. So I, I mean, I, I kind of love them all. They're all like, they're all like old friends that you take yeah. around the world. You know, it's just like, uh, I, I, I just. I, it doesn't like um, it's not lost on me how lucky we are. You know what I mean? That we, we we get to go play music. Even this last year, this last tour before COVID hit, we we were playing places we've never played before, like um, Estonia. Um, we went to Moscow and played. We went to Saint Petersburg. We went to um, um, Athens, Greece. Played for your people. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Two nights in um, Israel at the Caesarea Amphitheater we were talking about. Yeah, it was like, yeah. um, what, built in 27 or 28 BC. It's like 2,000 year old. We did two sold out nights there and just, it, it, and it's an archaeological dig right on the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Was, like, man, we are so lucky. We did, um, like, just like, even just on the last tour, just tripping around like, uh, South America with Judas Priest or Australia with Judas Priest and and just like, you know, having these like festivals where it's a gathering of the tribes, you know, yeah. and you play these special places and everybody goes and does their thing and then you meet again and now you're doing Rock and Rio or now you're doing like Rock and Ring in Germany and you're just running into all these people. I mean, uh, I think when we all get out there, we're going to have that appreciation more for this thing. You yeah. know, we, we didn't know how lucky we are just to sit around sit around these uh these catering tables just having a laugh and like you know comparing like all these questions you're asking me hey what what's your favorite uh what's your favorite distortion pedal or whatever you know i mean these these conversations happen every day and it's just like i miss everything about our business right now you know so yeah. i'm very humbled and i'm very um just so grateful like that i've been able to do this for so long and and just um just still love love it so much and it just comes down to playing songs that you like i couldn't imagine being in a band i didn't like you know yeah, I probably, yeah. I probably, even no matter what the money was um you know you guys mentioned heart earlier um after lane passed away and randy castillo passed away my drummer in in the Aussie mm -hmm. band i was in just such a bad place and uh just just felt really upset and like uh depressed and just you know and then Anna and nancy said uh and they're like my older sisters, right? And they said, listen, you just need to play music. So why don't you just grab a couple basses and play bass with us on one summer tour? And you just need to play, dude. And so I just I just took my beat up, tore up ass, and I just jumped up, jumped on their tour bus with a couple basses and turned out to be five years with the girls, you know? But I mean, I, whenever anything low happens in my life or the, you know, it's always music for some reason for me that always just I, if I just like just forget everything else, just forget everything else and just play, then usually some cool stuff happens, you know. Yeah. And um, some and growth happens, you know. And and um, every tour, yeah. I don't, I don't know. You guys, it's so funny. I always tell people who've never been on a world tour. Once you go on one tour, like your life is, it's gonna change. You're gonna make friends and you're gonna fall in love and you're gonna meet people and you're it's going to further your career but you go around the world with a band and come back you're 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 like a it's a, it's a life changing thing you've met new people your life has shifted you know and you, uh, every tour up to even the last tour that's happened for me like just you know good or bad but mo mostly for the good you just meet new people and someone hands you a new bass and go oh yeah this is a cool bass i'll play these for a while or a pedal or you know just uh it's, it's just really um 
special, man. I think I think we all forgot how special this thing was. And then yeah. this year just humbled everybody's ass, man. So yep. yeah, you mentioned yeah. heart and, and you being grateful. And I think that's what makes in my opinion, that's what separates the greats from people that just start kind of doing it and it's just a cyclical thing and instead of like actually like stopping the smell of the roses and you've had the perspective of traveling traveling the world and then you it's like you can't unsee that or unexperience that when you go back to your you know so-called day to day or whatever. And I think I, I could spot it a mile away. You can too, I bet. When you watch yeah. a band and mm-hmm. even if they're playing the forum, the LA forum or something big and there's like I could always tell when they they're they're not into it and they're faking it. Yep. You know? Yeah. And uh I don't mean to talk bad about them, but like a lot of country acts are like that because they just hire dudes and they go out and they do the weekend warrior thing or whatever. They put them on salary and then the guys are all, oh, this is a good money making gig for me. So I'll just do this for a while. And and then you yep. see them up on stage and they are just like not into it. You could just, you know, they're faking it like they're they have a smile on their face and they're doing the thing. But you could just hear it and they're playing. Mm-hmm. Just, you could smell it on them like, oh, like, that guy's yeah. fucking phoning it in. That <laughs> motherfucker's phoning it in. It's yeah. I resent it. I yeah. actually like when I see that I resent it because I'm just like, uh, I I don't ever want to put myself above anyone anywhere. But it's, I just don't understand the how you can get in the mindset of where that's an automatic thing and that's not just like a like I want to shake people like that. Or it's just yeah. like you're playing in front of thousands of people. Like that's a gift. That oh, is- yeah, you know, there's other people that would love to play that gig. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, in and it's funny because obviously we know a lot of people that are in that, that are doing those gigs too. And it's like, you know, especially in the Nashville thing, there's not a lot of ownership from the side men side of things yeah. that it's like, Sean, Sean, bless his heart that passed, you know, Sean, he, he was, he was finding that a little bit, you know, like yeah. doing these gigs and he, he, um, yeah. And yeah, I was, I was trying to like, you know, um, be his buddy on that stuff. You know, it's like, well, yep. just, just write and keep doing doing stuff and just just surround yourself with cool people. That's like one of the biggest things I could recommend any young player. Just yep. hang out with the right people, man. Don't yeah. hang out with there's too many dicks in the world. Don't hang out with dicks. <laughs> That's it. You're five, right? That's, I was talking to a buddy last night. You were talking about like who is your top who are you the five people you most hang out with? Because that's that's a reflection of you and that's a reflection of where you're going. And right. somebody got it down to like if you hung out with two people that you aspired to be. Uh, one person that was kind of, or two people that like were kind of at your level and that you can really relate to. And then like one that was somebody that you could lift up kind of thing. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. Uh, Am I supposed to answer these questions about the world famous bass sound on the MTV Unplugged album? Oh yeah. You're seeing these too. That's me too. I didn't see the whole question over here. So that, that thing was like, um, God, that was like $135 uh, Alvarez bass. And, uh, and uh, like a forty dollar chorus pedal. That, that was it. Yeah, that, that was, was it. it. Yeah, everybody's always asking me. And Toby Wright mixed and mixed and mastered that record, right? So, you know, we did a we did a lot of. Um, uh, oh yeah, that was a record. That was a record. We were at Electric Ladyland. It wasn't unplugged. It was a um, the unplugged record was Electric Ladyland. We mixed that over there. But um, yeah, that that's all Toby Wright just making it sound cool in the studio. Wow, yeah. just the bass and a chorus pedal. That's it. Yeah, bass and a chorus, chorus pedal. That's it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, All right. Can't, can't think is- much. I like a little bit of chorus on like some slow songs or acoustic wise. I'll play. I'll do a little bit of, um, do a little bit of chorus. Uh, Tech Twenty One's making some nice pedals. You know, I like those fly rigs they make, like Richie Cotton's fly yeah. rig or Doug Pinnock has one now. Yep. And yep. when when I just got the practice amps around, I'll plug one of those in a lot, you know, just to kind of get some sort of vibe if you're playing, watching TV or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're pretty good. <laughs> but, um, like, I haven't checked out. Uh, the Ampeg pedals were pretty good. At the NAMM show last year, I played through a couple of them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah we have a chorus awesome. pedal. Mm-hmm. This one's my favorite. Oh, nice looker, too. Yeah, we haven't we haven't sent you any of the pedals, like the chorus pedal, the compressor pedal, or anything. I'll have to check before you send them. I know I have I have a, a racks just full of full of pedals that uh, Paul Binder, uh, our our production manager, I'll get these out of the storage locker. So I brought them home, you know. So I got people give them to me and send them to me all the time, you know. I yeah. think you see what I got, you know. So, but I have a whole me. lot of pedals in the studio. I'll do I do, but like. Um, I, I just like a nice pure bass tone, and I get yeah. that from a, a good sounding instrument 
nice pickups and bright strings and and um and you of course yeah. you know that's, 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 that's yeah one that of our comes you Point yeah out. I, guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I was i was yeah, i can't do anything I'm, about that either <laughs> so I, I don't really <laughs> about that i just do my i just try to make noise and not screw up that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> you know it's i was just gonna say i was you know when we were talking about the pedals i was like man the our artist relations guy sucks if he didn't send you any pedals. I think I do. Yeah, I'm looking at one of the. Yeah, I'll look. At, yeah, I'll look. Yeah, find out. Find out. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, I had one of your um, the distortion pedals, and it was it was it was really uh, like a blowtorchy, little too blowtorchy for me. Yeah. yeah, that's the scrambler. Yeah, it can get a little raspy at times. Yeah, the scrambler. That's the one. Yeah, the DI scrambler and yeah, yeah. Using those, the old. Uh, I've been using the old tube DI. Are you gonna bring yes. those back? Oh man, that would say. Yes, hey. Go. Yeah, even they. I I got um, I got a clean channel of the um, uh, the uh, the mic pre one too. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah okay. so yep. I use that one. So when I'm when I'm doing like a guitar track or something, I always split it and I do one clean one just through that that Ampeg mic mic pre. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, then so I can reamp it later, you know. So yeah. that's what I use as my reamp in in is that because uh, it has a nice volume on it and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, cool. it's warm. Yeah, that's what I've been using for the um for the reamp channel. I'll have to remember that. That's I you know I, I've been I've been Those searching are bucks on eBay now. Yeah, they're hard to find. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a collection of the DIs, mm -hmm. and so I've got two here in the studio. And then I've got one on my board, on my live board. And then I've got Dom actually has one of mine too. Yeah. Cheers. Clink. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> clink. But <laughs> mic pre's, I'm looking for a mic pre because. Uh, yeah, it has the knob right on the, on the thing. Yeah, right. Logo. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, and that's Nancy Wilson's secret weapon. She used to run two of those into two Trace Elliott acoustic. That was her acoustic uh, guitar vibe. She'd run two of those. Ampeg mic pre's, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, don't... Joe Barisi and Joe Barisi's all. That's not a direct. Uh, that's not a. That's not a. Uh, that's not a di. It's a mic pre, man. Use that as your. You know. So Bar yeah. Joe Barisi told me to use it as that. Yeah, yeah. It's um, but you can't like you say you can you can find the di's. The mic pre's are really hard to find, and the people that have them, they don't let them go. Yeah. Yeah. Because. There, yeah, there was one. There was one guy that I knew. A buddy of mine had a mic pre, and I told him, "I says I'll trade you the, a DI and some. You know, obviously the mic pre is a little more money. I said I'll trade you a DI and some cash for your mic pre." He was like, "Uh, -uh. the mic pre doesn't. The mic pre is not going anywhere." Yeah, that's one of my my most used boxes actually, because it, you know anything, even bass or guitar or uh, anything that I can reamp later. There's a channel going through that that uh, into into the computer so i could always okay. use computer. yeah yeah it's such a uh just a just a nice box you know why, why don't we bring those back love it who do we talk to you know uh Mark. the guy the guy in the black shirt there oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next to the 20 other people that <laughs> um, they're, they're so well made too i mean it's not yeah. they, they, these are stout these are like yeah. boat anchors man they're they're built really good yeah really well. Yeah, you could anchor your small, you could anchor your rowboat with one of these things easily. <laughs> rare and special, and I've been dying to ask this question. You said, you know, lived through LA in the 80s, uh, Seattle in the 90s, and then we were talking about like everything moving kind of online. It's like, do you anticipate or kind of like, first of all, how are those uniquely special in their own right in terms of scenes? And do you think another area of a scene will happen again, or maybe it, that is only online now? I don't know. I, that's a great question. Like maybe this is a scene, you know? Right? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I think art's going to pop up anyway. Like it's, we did uh, pre-production in Dusseldorf, Germany. I've never spent any time in Dusseldorf, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I went there and there was artists putting like statues of like these weird, weird like figures crawling up buildings. And it was like kind of Singapore-y. Oh, wow. like, all, all the architecture and the art. Yeah. So, there's, there's places where art just like pops up and like, like blooms, like yeah, yeah, fungus or mushrooms or something. You know, it just art comes out of places like Vienna or whatever. And you know, there's these places that 
and Seattle was one for a while and LA and Athens, Georgia, um, Minneapolis. Yep. And, you know, you could just go, it's, it's, I think it's all just depending on the, once again, it's the music. So, I mean, you know, yeah. you could want one of those scenes to happen anywhere, but if it's a bunch of crap bands, it's not going to happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's so I many think bands. Where do you get, where do you get the good music online? There's, God, I know there's great music out there and you could spend hours searching and searching and not find it still. You know, there's just so sure. much bad music too. So I don't, I don't yeah. think they plan those things. They just kind of happen. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, keep in mind too, back in those days, you know, when, when LA was a scene and Seattle was a scene that was prior to being able to go on YouTube and check out things. And like, if you wanted to, if you if you wanted to go to if you wanted to check out a scene you had to go to scene right to check it out and i think that drew more people in you know like once something starts rolling it eventually like you know i'm it, it's kind of like a snowball effect more and more people are attracted to that area and before you know it seattle's exploding you know the rocks Seattle, well. from what i could tell this is coming from a guy from la like it, it's funny because like um Dave Grohl's from Virginia and like I'm from LA and Eddie's from San Diego, you know, <laughs> so we, had, we had a unique kind of like flip when we went in there and now yeah. we're all like Seattle, you know, honorary, you know, dudes. Yeah. yeah. But um, like from what we can tell, I've had this talk with Dave uh, too about like that those bands like Soundgarden, for instance, was a band they're in a basement for 10 years playing local gigs and, and, they had a chance to like develop into a sound, you know, like they turned into Soundgarden and like Nirvana there, you know, like nobody was paying attention to the Pacific Northwest. So these bands were just up there just growing and defining who they were. Yep. And Screaming Tree sounds different than Mud Honey sounds different than Soundgarden sounds different than Nirvana sounds different than Alice in Chains. All those bands have their own identity because they, they could, they could like grow into that. You know, they had the time to grow into their own kind of. Yeah. Tech. Yeah. Yeah. During that time in LA, it was like, you know, oh, we need to get a bass player with long blonde hair. And, you know, yeah. they're getting record deals before they even like played a gig. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, Soundgarden's up there <clears throat> just whooping ass, right? And <laughs> Nirvana's playing shows and just turning into Nirvana. I mean, you know, I, I just think, uh, yeah, I mean, God. And, and then <clears throat> what was weird is like, so the whole thing blows up then now nobody's home. All those bands are out and on the road and they're never home. And then, you know, that affects you a certain, a whole different way too. You know I mean? Yeah. yeah it's a whole different, that's a whole different like grizzly bear of something you have to deal with, you know, too. And yeah. And it's not always an end pretty ending to these stories, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm glad it happened, you know, and I'm glad that those guys got to be, playing all those gigs and turn into, you know, Kurt Cobain and Lane Staley and Chris Cornell and fucking Pearl Jam. And, you know, I just like, God, I just, what a special uh, time in music. You know, I, I mean, yeah. all those, all those records that were just solid records, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But like Stone you Temple said, Pilots, they... fantastic band right there. Stone Temple Pilots, you know, oh, yeah. great yeah. albums coming out and, and they're from LA. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Man. So well, where are the new bands? Who's who's some new bands? Turn me on to some new bands. Well, that's just it. It's like, where are the new bands? Because you know, I, I mean, my daughters make fun of me because you know, I'll I'll go upstairs after this and put on Led Zeppelin too, and they'll be like, dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they they enjoy it. My kids are actually into the music that I listen to. But you know, I mean, they're twenty five and and seventeen, so they're kind of. You know, they, but they turned me on. Like, I, I know, I know this isn't a new band, but my daughter, my oldest daughter, when she was younger, like she was turning me on to, um, you know, turn me on to Stone Sour, Stone Sour, and turn me on to Avenged Sevenfold, and like, right. these are bands that I knew nothing about because they were beyond my time at that point. It's like now I'm fans. Yeah, there's some good players in all those bands, though. Yeah. 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 You know, you know? And, and kind of see to see them like develop. So I'm I'm kind of looking forward to like the next Avenge album. I think it's going to kick ass. You know, yeah. um, Roy Mayorga, like you, just from the band you brought up, like Stone Sour, the drummer, uh, Roy Mayorga, yep. monster yep. drummer. Yeah, he's going out with Ministry again. I think in this fall, so he's he's touring again. Okay, like, 
the players in those bands are like wicked players, man. They're, yeah. they're really good musicians, you know, whether you like their music or not, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, you go back to the, like the old, you know, the metal days in LA or, you know, uh, even, even, even the, the country guys that are out doing the country gigs, these guys are all monster players. Right. You know, right. I, I mean, I get, I come from the hair metal days too. It's like, you know, my, my kids make fun of me. They see old pictures of me in spandex and, and big hair. And it's like, yeah, I was like, yeah, but, but, you know, <laughs> you know it's like, but, but all those cats could play. Like we sat down and we actually played our instruments, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. everything else was just kind of superficial to get noticed. The so, thing for me was weird. Like when you had the bands, like, you, you know, you had your, like, I mean, the eighties was a, when we were in high school, it's like what you had, like, ACDC, Back in Black, you had like, you know, look, look at all those albums that were coming out at the time, yeah. albums and Rush albums and Moving Pictures, uh, Back in Black, you know, just, I mean, you go down the list, that was like the golden age of metal. Yeah, yeah. But later, like a lot of the LA metal I didn't like because I thought the guitar players were fantastic, but then the um, rhythm sections weren't very interesting, you know, it's just kind of like plodding chunk, along. Chunk, so. Chunk. Yeah, so that's why I was, I was glad when like, uh, when when it did change over into the like the, like those those rhythm sections from Seattle were really good. I mean, yeah, watch Matt Cameron play drums or Ben Shepard play bass. I mean, there's some really good, you know, Jeff Amant's amazing bass player. You know, I mean, there's just really quality. It's, it all comes down to just how much you want to practice, and that comes from how much you really like music and how much you really want to do it. So I mean, it's all really the heart of it, you know. And it's yep. like the music side of it versus the online marketing social media side of it now too. It's like yeah, I'm a, yeah. What is now they'll let you be famous? They won't pay you, but they'll let you be as famous as you want to be online, you know. It's got like that sound or or the musicianship is like the first thing that I experience, and then like everything else doesn't matter. It's just like that is the thing that speaks to you, not the oh wow, who's this person that has a million followers that yeah, I don't know. Is giving yeah. you tutorials and now they make cereal or something. <laughs> don't, don't even get me going on that i can't even keep up with like twitch and like tiktok and all this stuff i'm just i'm just an old guy i'm just an old guy <laughs> we're actually we're the same age so i don't i don't know anything about those things but you know i will say this <laughs> stay off of tiktok because it is so freaking addicting <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> my, my daughter my daughter put it on my phone and one night, like literally, I'm laying in bed at two o'clock in the morning, like this. Oh, yeah. It's it's uh it's hyp hypnotism. Yeah, I think all that stuff is bad. I think all of it's bad because because you know what? Before you were bored, you're bored, you're you're bored shitless, and you're sitting there well, and then you pick up a bass, and then you're now you're you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Or you could just sit there doing this all day long and not sit there and do any kind of art. No, it's, we, we have a, we have a philosophy. Like when we go out for dinner, me and my wife and my daughters, we, not all the time, but a lot of times we try and leave all the cell phones in the car. It's like, you know what? Leave your phones in the car. I don't want to see a phone at the table and, and we're going to talk with people, you know? And that's just for a dinner. I mean, but art, you got to put the time in and you're, if you're just yeah. sitting there on your Facebook all day, you're not doing art. No, you're right. And You're then right. who's to say maybe I'm wrong? Maybe art isn't that important. Maybe like if that's me. I'm think that's my own projection of the trip. Is like no, yeah. art is important. Music is important. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. Yeah, I think it is. I right? I I, yeah. I I I hate to see. I would hate to see a world without music and art, though. That's and what I'm saying. There's a Kurt Cobain in high school somewhere right now going. Oh, there's no money to be made in music. So right. I'm do something else. And yeah. Then, Man, now you're missing out on some great music that isn't like that the next John Lennon yeah. could be writing. But instead, yeah. he's on fucking TikTok, right? <laughs> well, I have at least confirmed where, like, I have a record I've been working on for like three years that's going to come out hopefully in the next couple months. And I told myself, I was just like, during the writing and creation process, like, I can't be in the TikTok world and, and worrying about promoting it. Like I have to like literally I only have so much time I have to like finish the record and then like pivot over and just be like dance in front of the camera. So yeah, give yourself deadlines too. That's why I always tell kids like give yeah. yourself you know and there's this one kid um he's in a band with my one of my little cousins and um so I taught him his modes right mm -hmm. 
here we are five years later. He's still, oh yeah, I'm still working on the modes. It's like, what are you doing? Just like make music out of that now. And just like, yeah. you know, yeah, but yeah. he's like, like give yourself a, a time limit on everything, you know? It's like, okay, that this this amount of time to record demos, okay? And for, for three weeks, I'm just gonna sit down every day and I'm gonna write 10 songs. Then after that, you're gonna try to, you know, turn those into, you know, songs and, and re-record them with amps and or your friends. And, you know, it's like, um, so got to keep turning the page on these projects, you know, you got to interesting. Totally. Yeah. Give yeah. yourself deadlines. Deadlines are important. I think, you know, okay. No, that that's, that's, that's great advice. I never thought of that because we, like you say, we sit, I could sit here all day and, and, and throw down ideas and throw down ideas. And, you know, three years from now, like you say, I've got four hard drives full of ideas that never really turned into anything because, Right. And say, okay, at this time I need to I need to move on and make something else out of this sort of thing and give yourself a deadline on it. And maybe some of it's for soundtrack stuff or a commercial or, yeah. or other people or yourself or yeah. 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 Music's That's just not music. Music has a lot of different faces and purposes, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You gotta nudge yeah. it along. You gotta Yeah, yeah, you gotta listen to tell you where it wants to go and then push it back. <laughs> You know? Oh man, I think I think that's important, man. We just got to keep making a bunch of noise. That's it. Yeah, small ball. <laughs> keep it simple. Singles and doubles will win championships. Just, that's just it. doing this stuff. Just that's keep it. doing it. Showing up. Small ball. Small know? ball. That's it, man. <laughs> Singles and doubles. That is so true. And running up the flagpole. Don't ever be afraid to put your stuff out there. You know yeah. that's. I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of people out there that they're just like, I don't I don't know if I should put it out or it's not done yet or I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm fearless because I know for a fact that no one is going to like it. <laughs> so, there you go. It takes a lot of pressure off when you go this, you go ahead and have a good time with it. And then, then you're pleasantly surprised when people are like, oh, hey, that you're, I like your new album. It's like, wow, cool. Thanks. I do too. You know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah don't, um, yeah, you're not painting the Mona Lisa. Oh, that's awesome. The guy that was painting the Mona Lisa probably had other artwork he thought was better yeah. than that one. You know? Right, yeah, right. Yeah, for him, that, that, the, that was like a throwaway uh, B-side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is too funny. But it's true. It's absolutely true, man. Just put it out there. Put it out there and let the world decide, you know? Yeah, and don't let your own head stop it. I mean, yeah, yeah it's like, what's your motivation to do this stuff? It's just to have a good time and make a bunch of noise and hang out with your friends. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fellowship thing. It's a fellowship art, you know. Yep, yep, exactly. Every time we play rock and Rio, it's one hundred eighty thousand people. They're there for the same reason. They just want to get their fucking balls rocked, man. They want to see Iron Maiden hold that beating heart, out, that bloody heart, out of a gauntlet while he's sitting, you know, or Ramstein blowing some shit up. I mean, it's <laughs> awesome stuff, man. <laughs> man, we, all right. So we're I'm, we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you on this or you're going to leave us on this one last thing. What, because I know I haven't experienced it. I don't know if Dom has, but what is it like playing in front of 180,000 screaming people? It, it's, it's kind of, yeah. And they're all different, you know, like every different, it, like some of my favorite gigs were just the like club gigs or something or acoustic gigs where you're right there. Okay. With the people, but um, personally, and I'm the, also the one in the band that, I mean, we all like playing the big shows, but like, like my drummer Sean doesn't like the bigger ones because okay. it's a lot of pressure. You're on site, you have a lot of press to do, and then you're getting ready, and then you're throwing up. They're going up the ramp, and somebody's handing you a thing, and you're on a time limit, and you go, and you have this amount of time to play, and then you play, and then you're off real quick, and then poof, then you're on the bus, and it's over, and it's real quiet again. It's like, wow, what a rush of a day that was, right? Yep. And you see some friends along the way, and it's great and everything, but um, for me. The bigger, the better. <laughs> I highly recommend playing Rock and Rios or these. <laughs> highly recommend it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you're going to totally do a 180 yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love it. The big, bigger, the better, and they all got their flags from their different countries. And you're wow. just, I mean, whether like that, there's some like in uh, the Mount Fuji Rock Fest or something, and different countries have a different flavor to it. This is the whole like. Um, taking the bullet train or whatever and, and and just like eating Japanese food and just like the culture of that for a while and then you're playing that festival and that's a whole yeah. different thing than playing like the racetrack at Rock and Ring in, in Germany, for instance, you know, that's a whole different 
feel and vibe and yeah. um, health health fest in germany is one of the best in the world it's like the biggest right now in europe you know and there was this one called the mad cool festival i forgot what country okay. it was brussels or something but it was more like um radio heady type band different it was more diverse you know so I've been really getting off on those kind of festivals lately, not just just the metal festivals, you know, so it's really neat to, you know, yeah. be absorbed by them and different crews and different like styles of band, different press people. It's like, you know, it's really uh, different vibes. So I just love. I, I just oh, Madrid, somebody put Madrid. There you go. I just love it all. You know, <laughs> I love I love doing this shit, man. It's the best. I, I will go anywhere and play bass for anybody big or small or anything i just absolutely like love it i woke up one time in istanbul turkey and that's the farthest i've ever felt from my house you know? yeah yeah, yeah. I, I woke up in the morning i was like what that what's that sound and i opened the window and it was like during the chanting time in the prayer. day All the and, prayer. yeah and their whole country was doing it and you could just hear it, and it was like this man it's just like i mean just to experience things like that were, were amazing you know yeah like, yeah that's the only like real true Muslim country that like I've ever played in, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that was a trip. I, I just, I love going on these adventures, man. It's so I go down to LAX and, you know, I fly out of LAX on the, um, the, uh, they, they have a, a, a way for bands to go in and like kind of oh, yeah. that work, you know, like famous -y type people or whatever. And if there's yeah. a different way to get into your, to your American airlines, like I know most of the people. Like when you, when I go down to LAX, like I know the guys there that are and the girls that work the office there. They, they, hey, good to see you, Mike. Okay, let's go. I'll bring in a lounge. So they, you know, then I go to the lounge and I know all those people. Yep. It's, it's just so cool to like, you know. And for me, the American Airlines at LAX. When I'm in that lounge, my heart just starts pounding. And like, no matter where I'm going, I just know that I'm off on a great adventure. That I'm going to go somewhere killer because it's an international. You know, whether it's going south, going to Europe, going to Far East, where, wherever it is, Singapore, wherever you're going. It's just like whenever I hit that lounge, I just like I, I make the pivot. OK, I got to let go of the wife and dogs right now and I'm focused going forward. And I don't know what's going to be on the other side of it when I get off the plane. But I know it's just going to be an adventure. You know, I just That's uh, awesome. incredible. That's, I love waking that is up. so awesome. Meeting fans, petting their dogs, playing their guitar. I love it. I just love this whole thing. It's just a it's just a remarkable way to make a living, you know. That is awesome. Man, I can I do ooh, <laughs> that is so awesome. I'm we're gonna we're gonna call it right there because I it's folks, such man. a high note. <laughs> Good. And and we've I mean we've taken up an hour and a half of your time. So I know, it. dude. You're cutting into my TikTok time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I could have like did that for a while. <laughs> like, that, that is like and and that is that's it man that's you know that to me that's that that's why we do what we do that's why i do what i what i do i we you know that's part of life is going out and growing and experiencing things and and bringing them back to your people and you know every time i go out on the road i i tell my wife i'm doing reconnaissance for my for my our retirement I love and, that. and then she looks at me she's like what are you talking about? You're never going to retire. You're going to be doing this to the day you drop. It's like, because it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, I'll be an old man sitting, playing somewhere. Even if I'll, nobody's showing up, I'll, I'll, I, you know, I, I imagine you on a Greek Island somewhere at the end of your life, I will be your bass player and, and you'd be the singer and I'll be there or, or whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll start a band in Santorini, dude. And we'll sit there gonna, and drink coffee and hang out. <laughs> oh dude, you're on, you are on. We're going to, like I said, I'm going to do this until they tell me to stop doing it. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going to continue to do it and just piss everyone off. So <laughs> yeah, then there's the flip side of that is like, I am totally incapable of doing anything else. I have no training for any other job at this point. You know? <laughs> I barely can know how to work a gas pump, man. So right? I'm lucky oh. I get to do this for a living instead. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an absolute pleasasure. What a joy. This you know, and and have a very happy birthday tomorrow. I know you said yeah. you've got family and people coming in for for other events and yeah. you know, so enjoy I that time. I back in the whip on me today. Yeah. Toilet, pick up that dog shit. So <laughs> <laughs> from playing Rock and Rio to picking up dog shit today. <laughs> it real. Dude, oh, I love it. We're going to uh, we're going to sign off everybody. Thank you so much for watching.
Um, again, you know, another, another awesome SVT time. We're going to continue to do this as long as you folks allow us to do this. Uh, in two weeks, we have uh, Teja Veal from Jonelle, jo Jonelle Monet joining us. So in two weeks, be sure to check in, and uh, we'll see you guys then. All right. Awesome. Play Thanks more bass, guys. See ya. And then we're just going to.